Let's use this terrible economic crisis to question assumptions behind economic theory and to rethink the role of the state, finance, and austerity in promoting growth and innovation. The Greek economy has a very special role within the current process of reformulating the European Union and the European economy. The main issue is how you engage in getting unification inside the EU. Now we know that the European Union started out with what was called a single market act or the single European act, what, which was an attempt to reduce trade barriers inside all of the member states of the European Union. And the complement to this was the creation of a single currency, that is the euro, because if you're going to have a unified internal market, you also have to have a single currency so that the changes in exchange rates don't have an impact on trade. The Greek economy was one of the last economies to join the European Union and had a very special position. It represented the unification of the Mediterranean, basically Mediterranean countries, because Greece joined along with Spain uh, and Portugal to sort of complete what we would normally call the European project. The result was that the Greek economy converged as was required by the European Union in order to have what are called more or less common monetary policies because the single currency, the euro, required a central bank that would have a monetary policy that would be applicable across all countries. So basically the idea was that if you're going to have a single interest rate policy, you should have similar performance across all countries. So the Greek economy converged in terms of the decline in inflation rates, in terms of its government expenditure policies and a wide range of other issues which allowed it to join the euro, the single currency. Now the difficulties were created subsequently when, as Keynes had predicted, financial adjustments tend to occur much more rapidly than adjustments in other factors, in particular factors such as wages. And when the German economy, in the aftermath of the union between East and West Germany, embarked on a policy in which wages were kept below productivity growth so that Germany became a much more competitive economy inside the European Union, this created internal differences across countries, and in particular the Greek economy, which had already gone through an adjustment policy to join the Euro, found that it was becoming less competitive. And this set up a movement or a deficit in terms of trade between particular Germany and Greece, but also the other uh, Mediterranean countries. Now, if a country is running a deficit on its trade accounts with other regions, those deficits have to be financed, and this is where the financing came into the story. German banks were very happy to lend to Greece in order to fund what was Greece, Greece's consumption and imports of German goods. And as a result, Greek deficits and Greek debts tended to increase as at the same time German deficits were decreasing. So that eventually you reached a position in which Greece had created a very substantial imbalance. And this was the start of the so-called Greek crisis. In particular, it was when Papandreou was uh, elected as prime minister and he looked at his national accounts and discovered that in fact the deficits were much higher than the previous government had, uh, had anticipated. The response was the same kind of response that we've seen in Latin America. When foreign investors invest in a country and they discover that the country's performance is not what they expect, they leave. And this is the same thing that happened. The German banks, and in particular French banks, cut off their funding to Greece, and this is the beginning of the Greek crisis. Now the question is then, how do you resolve this difficulty? The European Union has argued that the difficulty in Greece was caused by excessive 
Greek expenditures and the way to resolve the problem is by reducing those expenditures. Now this of course completely ignores the role of the financial system in financing those expenditures. So the question, the first question that has to be resolved was the difficulty created by the internal financial market that was created by the euro or was it created by Greek policies that were deficient. Now, people say that Greeks tend to be relatively lazy. Well, it turns out that Greek workers have a, well, not a longer uh, work week, they have the longest work week of any European country. So it's pretty clear that it's not that the Greek workers are slacking off that created the difficulties. In any case, the European Union decided that the way in which they would resolve this problem and allow Greece to rejoin the, uh, to remain within the euro area was by very draconian cuts in, first of all, government expenditures in order to be able to repay the banks that had lent the money. Now, this seems on the face of it reasonable. If you have borrowed money, you should pay it back, and the way you pay back that money is by running a surplus. Well, the question is, how do you run that surplus? The argument was that they run the surplus by cutting expenditures and at the same time by reducing wages, reducing employment in the government sector. Now the impact of this is what? Well, if you cut wages and if you reduce employment, quite obviously you reduce national income. If you reduce national income, you're also reducing the tax yield of the government. So that in fact, the impact of these policies has been a year-on-year -year decline in GDP of a rough average of around 6% for the last three years. That is, if you look, GDP, national income in Greece, is down something like 25 to 30% from what it was before the crisis. This also means, obviously, that government revenues are down by that proportion. And it means that the government has not been able to generate any fiscal surplus available in order to repay the outstanding debts. Now, the problem effectively has been resolved because the European Central Bank has intervened and offered to purchase the debts and to remove them from the balance sheets of the banks. So at this stage, the German banks and the French banks that had lent to Greece no longer have that exposure on their books. The risk of the financial crisis has now passed, but now we have a risk of a co total collapse in the Greek economy because the European Union continues to insist that Greece continue to impose sharp reductions in terms of government expenditures and in terms of wages. Now, the basic other side of this argument is not only that this was supposed to generate funds to repay the debts, but also it was supposed to make Greece a more competitive economy reducing its wage rates was supposed to bring about a very sharp increase in Greek exports. Now, in fact, exports from Greece have increased in the last, uh, in the last quarter. Unfortunately, this is not in terms of expanding the actual expansion of exports that are produced by Greek workers. Most of this was due to an increase in what we call bunkerage. That is, this is the import, the refining, and then the re-export of petroleum products. And because of the sharp increase in refined products that has occurred in the last quarter, this is the basic explanation of the improvement of the, uh, the Greek export position. This is important. Why? It basically, it's important because if the government is unable to generate a fiscal surplus, the other alternative means for Greece to repay its debts is by generating an external surplus. Unfortunately, the reduction in wages has not brought about any increase in competitiveness, and in particular, it doesn't resolve the problem because Greece does not have a very large export market within the EU. Most of Greece's export earnings come from shipping and from tourism. That is, their manufacturing base tends to be relatively small. So that this presents a very, very difficult method and, as we've seen, a method which so far does not work. So the question that is faced by both the European Union leaders and the uh, politicians in Greece is whether they will continue these sorts of policies, which means effectively a continual decline in national incomes, a continual increase 
increase in unemployment and eventually increasing social unrest within the country. At some stage, a decision has to be taken to recognize that these policies, what we call the austerity policies of reducing incomes, simply will not work. Now, the question then is raised is what sort of policy would be sensible? Now, if the Greek economy does not have a national productive base which is sufficient in order to provide increasing, increasing competitive exports or increasing employment, then it would seem that the obvious mechanism would be to increase expenditures and not necessarily just government expenditures but to increase investment expenditures that is we've talked about a Marshall Plan that was used in order to save the European economies after the Second World War in the European Union today you have at least three if not four economies that is we're talking about Portugal Spain Greece and with the inclusion of Italy that would require the same sort of external impact through an increase in investment in order to make these economies more competitive. Now, this is the one part of the solution on the side of these four economies. The other side of the solution is that we started out this story talking about Germany and Germany's decision to engage in a reduction in domestic uh, wage rates and unit labor costs. Now, Unless there is a countervailing adjustment in Germany, that is, unless Germany is willing to contribute to this sort of adjustment, the simple increase in investment in the Mediterranean economy simply will not work. Germany also has to be willing to use its surplus position in order to expand domestic demand in Germany so that it provides the counterpart to the Mediterranean economies in terms of the production uh, of output and their solutions.